Moby Dick, chapters 114 to 118. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters 114 to 118. Chapter 114 The Gilder. Penetrating further and further into the heart of the Japanese cruising ground, the Pequod was soon all astir in the fishery, often in mild, pleasant weather, for twelve, fifteen, eighteen, and twenty hours on the stretch, they were engaged in the boats, steadily pulling, or sailing, or paddling after the whales, or for an interlude of sixty or seventy minutes, calmly awaiting their uprising, though with but small success for their pains. At such times, under an unabated sun, afloat all day upon smooth, slow, heaving swells, seated in his boat light as a birch canoe, and so sociably mixing with the soft waves themselves, that like hearthstone cats they purr against the gunwale. These are the times of dreamy quietude, when beholding the tranquil beauty and brilliancy of the ocean's skin, one forgets the tiger heart that pants beneath it, and would not willingly remember that this velvet paw but conceals a remorseless fang. These are the times when in his whaleboat the rover softly feels a certain filial, confident, land-like feeling towards the sea, that he regards it as so much flowery earth, and the distant ship revealing only the tops of her masts seems struggling forward not through high rolling waves, but through the tall grass of a rolling prairie, as when the western emigrants' horses only show their erected ears, while their hidden bodies widely wade through the amazing verdure. The long-drawn virgin veils, the mild blue hillsides, as over these there steals the hush, the hum, you almost swear that play-wearied children lie sleeping in these solitudes in some glad May-time, when the flowers of the woods are plucked. And all this mixes with your most mystic mood, so that fact and fancy, halfway meeting, interpenetrate and form one seamless whole. Nor did such soothing scenes, however temporary, fail of at least as temporary an effect on Ahab. But if these secret golden keys did seem to open in him his own secret golden treasuries, yet did his breath upon them prove but tarnishing. O oh, grassy glades! O oh, ever vernal endless landscapes in the soul! In ye, though long parched by the dead drought of the earthly life, in ye men yet may roll, like young horses in new morning clover, and for some few fleeting moments feel the cool dew of the life immortal on them. Would to God these blessed calms would last! But the mingled, mingling threads of life are woven by warp and woof, calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm. There is no steady, unretracing progress in this life. We do not advance through fixed gradations, and at the last one pause, through infancy's unconscious spell, boyhood's thoughtless faith, adolescence's doubt, the common doom, then skepticism, then disbelief, resting at last in manhood's pondering repose of if. But once gone through, we trace the round again, and are infants, boys, and men, and ifs eternally. Where lies the final harbor, whence we unmoor no more? In what rapt ether sails the world, of which the weariest will never weary? Where is the foundling's father hidden? Our souls are like those orphans whose unwedded mothers die in bearing them. The secret of our paternity lies in their grave." and we must there to learn it. And that same day, too, gazing far down from his boat's side into that same golden sea, Starbuck lowly murmured, Loveliness unfathomable, as ever lover saw in his young bride's eye. Tell me not of thy teeth-tiered sharks and thy kidnapping cannibal ways. Let faith oust fact, let fancy oust memory. I look deep down and do believe. And Stubb, 
fish-like, with sparkling scales, leaped up in that same golden light. I am Stubb, and Stubb has his history. But here Stubb takes oaths that he has always been jolly. Chapter 115 The Pequod Meets the Bachelor and jolly enough were the sights and sounds that came bearing down before the wind some few weeks after Ahab's harpoon had been welded. It was a Nantucket ship, the Bachelor, which had just wedged in her last cask of oil, and bolted down her bursting hatches, and now, in glad holiday apparel, was joyously, though somewhat vaingloriously, sailing round among the widely separated ships on the ground, previous to pointing her prow for home. The three men at her masthead wore long streamers of narrow red bunting at their hats. From the stern a whale-boat was suspended, bottom down, and hanging captive from the bowsprit was seen the long lower jaw of the last whale they had slain. Signals, ensigns, and jacks of all colors were flying from her rigging, on every side. Sideways lashed in each of her three basketed tops were two barrels of sperm, above which, in her topmast cross-trees, you saw slender breakers of the same precious fluid, and nailed to her main truck was a brazen lamp. As was afterwards learned, the bachelor had met with the most surprising success, all the more wonderful, for that while cruising in these same seas, numerous other vessels had gone entire months without securing a single fish. Not only had barrels of beef and bread been given away to make room for the far more valuable sperm, but additional supplemental casks had been bartered for from the ship she had met, and these were stowed along the deck, and in the captain's and officers' state-rooms. Even the cabin table itself had been knocked into kindling wood, and the cabin mess dined off the broad head of an oil butt, lashed down to the floor for a centerpiece. In the forecastle, the sailors had actually cocked and pitched their chests, and filled them. It was humorously added that the cook had clapped a head on his largest boiler, and filled it, that the steward had plugged his spare coffee-pot and filled it, that the harpooners had headed the sockets of their iron and filled them, that indeed everything was filled with sperm, except the captain's pantaloons' pockets, and those he reserved to thrust his hands into, in self-complacent testimony of his entire satisfaction. As this glad ship of good luck bore down upon the moody Pequod, the barbarian sound of enormous drums came from her forecastle, and, drawing still nearer, a crowd of her men were seen standing round her huge tripods, which, covered with the parchment-like poke or stomach skin of the black fish, gave forth a loud roar to every stroke of the clenched hands of the crew. On the quarter-deck the mates and harpooners were dancing with the olive-hued girls who had eloped with them from the Polynesian Isles, while suspended in an ornamented boat, firmly secured aloft between the foremast and the mainmast, three Long Island negroes with glittering fiddle-bows of whale-ivory were presiding over the hilarious jig. Meanwhile, Others of the ship's company were tumultuously busy at the masonry of the triworks, from which the huge pots had been removed. You would have almost thought they were pulling down the cursed Bastille, such wild cries they raised, as the now useless brick and mortar were being hurled into the sea. Lord and master over all this scene, the captain stood a wreck on the ship's elevated quarter-deck, so that the whole rejoicing drama was full before him and seemed merely contrived for his own individual diversion. And Ahab, he too was standing on his quarter-deck, shaggy and black, with a stubborn gloom, and as the two ships crossed each other's wakes, one all jubilations for things past, the other all forebodings as to things to come, their two captains, in themselves, impersonated the whole striking contrast of the scene. "'Come aboard! Come aboard!' cried the gay bachelor's commander, lifting a glass and a bottle in the air. "'Hast seen the white whale?' gritted Ahab in reply. "'No, only heard of him. But don't believe in him at all,' said the other good-humouredly. "'Come aboard!' "'Thou art too damn jolly. Sail on!' 
Hast lost any men? Not enough to speak of. Two islanders, that's all. But come aboard, old Hardy, come along. I'll soon take that black from your brow. Come along, will ye? Mary's the play. A full ship and homeward bound. How wondrous familiar is a fool, muttered Ahab, and then aloud. Thou art a full ship and homeward bound, thou sayest. Well, then, call me an empty ship and outward bound. So go thy ways, and I will mine. Forward there, set all sail, and keep her to the wind. And thus, while the one ship went cheerily before the breeze, the other stubbornly fought against it, and so the two vessels parted, the crew of the Pequod looking with grave, lingering glances toward the receding bachelor. But the bachelor's men never heeding their gaze for the lively revelry they were in. And as Ahab, leaning over the taffrail, eyed the homeward-bound craft, he took from his pocket a small vial of sand, and then looking from the ship to the vial, seemed thereby bringing two remote associations together, for that vial was filled with Nantucket soundings. Chapter 116 The Dying Whale not seldom in this life, when, on the right side, fortune's favourites sail close by us, we, though all a-droop before, catch somewhat of the rushing breeze, and joyfully feel our bagging sails fill out. So seemed it with the Pequod, for next day, after encountering the gay bachelor, whales were seen, and four were slain, and one of them by Ahab. It was far down the afternoon, and when all the spearings of the crimson fight were done, and floating in the lovely sunset sea and sky, sun and whale both stilly died together, then such a sweetness and such plaintiveness, such inwreathing orisons, curled up in that rosy air, that it almost seemed as if far over from the deep green convent valleys of the Manila Isles, the Spanish land-breeze, wantonly turned sailor, had gone to sea, freighted with these vesper hymns. Soothed again, but only soothed to deeper gloom, Ahab, who had sterned off from the whale, sat intently watching his final wanings from the now tranquil boat. For that strange spectacle observable in all sperm-whales dying, the turning sunwards of the head, and so expiring, that strange spectacle beheld of such a placid evening, somehow to Ahab conveyed a wondrousness unknown before. He turns and turns him to it. How slowly, but how steadfastly, his homage rendering and invoking brow, with his last dying motions. He too worships fire, most faithful, broad, baronial vassal of the sun. Oh, that these two favoring eyes should see these two favoring sights! Look, here, far water-locked, beyond all hum of human weal or woe, in these most candid and impartial seas, where to traditions no rocks furnish tablets, where for long Chinese ages the billows have still rolled on speechless and unspoken to, as stars that shine upon the Niger's unknown source. Here, too, life dies sunwards, full of faith. But see, no sooner dead than death whirls round the corpse, and it heads some other way. O oh, thou dark Hindu half of nature, who of drowned bones hast builded thy separate throne somewhere in the heart of these unverdured seas, thou art an infidel, thou queen, and too truly speakest to me in the wide slaughtering typhoon, and the hushed burial of its after calm. Nor has this thy wail sunwards turned his dying head, and then gone round again, without a lesson to me. O oh, trebly hooped and welded hip of power! O oh, high aspiring rainbowed jet! That one strivest, this one jettest all in vain! In vain, O oh whale, dost thou seek interceedings with yon all-quickening sun, that only calls forth life, but gives it not again. Yet dost thou, darker half, 
rock me with a prouder if a darker faith. All thy unnameable imminglings float beneath me here. I am buoyed by breaths of once living things, exhaled as air but water now. Then hail, forever hail, O sea, in whose eternal tossings the wild fowl finds his only rest. Born of earth, yet suckled by the sea, though hill and valley mothered me, you billows are my foster brothers. Chapter 117 The Whale Watch The four whales slain that evening had died wide apart, one far to windward, one less distant to leeward, one ahead, one astern. These last three were brought alongside ere nightfall, but the windward one could not be reached till morning, and the boat that had killed it lay by its side all night, and that boat was Ahab's. The waif-pole was thrust upright into the dead whale's spout-hole, and the lantern hanging from its top cast a troubled, flickering glare upon the black, glossy back, and far out upon the midnight waves, which gently chafed the whale's broad flank, like soft surf upon a beach. Ahab and all his boat's crew seemed asleep but the Parsi, who, crouching in the bow, sat watching the sharks that spectrally played round the whale, and tapped the light cedar planks with their tails. A sound like the moaning in squadrons over asphaltites of unforgiven ghosts of Gomorrah ran shuddering through the air. Startled from his slumbers, Ahab, face to face, saw the Parsi, and hooped round by the gloom of the night, they seemed the last men in a flooded world. "'I have dreamed it again,' said he. "'Of the hearses? Have I not said, old man, that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine? And who are hearsed that die on the sea? But I said, old man, that ere thou couldst die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen by thee on the sea, the first not made by mortal hands, and the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America. Aye, aye, a strange sight that, Parsi, a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean with the waves for the pallbearers. Ha! Such a sight we shall not soon see. Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen, old man. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it come to the last, I shall still go before thee, thy pilot. And when thou art so gone before, if that ever befall, then, ere I can follow, thou must still appear to me, to pilot me still. Was it not so? Well, then, did I believe all you say, O oh, my pilot. I have here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Take another pledge, old man, said the Parsi, as his eyes lighted up like fireflies in the gloom. Hemp only can kill thee. The gallows, ye mean? I am immortal, then, on land and on sea, cried Ahab with a laugh of derision. Immortal, on land and on sea. Both were silent again, as one man. The grey dawn came on, and the slumbering crew arose from the boat's bottom, and ere noon the dead whale was brought to the ship. Chapter 118 The Quadrant The season for the line at length drew near, and every day when Ahab, coming from his cabin, cast his eyes aloft, the vigilant helmsman would ostentatiously handle his spokes, and the eager mariners quickly run to the braces, and would stand there with all their eyes centrally fixed on the nailed doubloon, impatient for the order to point the ship's prow for the equator. In good time the order came. It was hard upon high noon, and Ahab, seated in the bows of his high-hoisted boat, was about taking his wonted daily observation of the sun to determine his latitude. Now in that Japanese sea the days in summer are as freshets of effulgences. 
that unblinkingly vivid Japanese sun seems the blazing focus of the glassy ocean's immeasurable burning glass. The sky looks lacquered, clouds there are none, the horizon floats, and this nakedness of unrelieved radiance is as the insufferable splendors of God's throne. Well that Ahab's quadrant was furnished with colored glasses, through which to take sight of that solar fire. So, swinging his seated form to the roll of the ship, and with his astrological-looking instrument placed to his eye, he remained in that posture for some moments to catch the precise instant when the sun should gain its precise meridian. Meantime, while his whole attention was absorbed, the Parsee was kneeling beneath him on that ship's deck, and with face thrown up like Ahab's, was eyeing the same sun with him, only the lids of his eyes half-hooded their orbs, and his wild face was subdued to an earthly passionlessness. At length the desired observation was taken, and with his pencil upon his ivory leg, Ahab soon calculated what his latitude must be at that precise instant. Then, falling into a moment's reverie, he again looked up towards the sun, and murmured to himself, Thou sea-mark, thou high and mighty pilot! Thou tellest me truly where I am, but canst thou cast the least hint where I shall be? Or canst thou tell where some other thing besides me is this moment living? Where is Moby Dick? This instant thou must be eyeing him. These eyes of mine look into the very eye that is now beholding him. Ay, and into the eye that is even now equally beholding the objects on the unknown thither side of thee, thou son. Then, gazing at his quadrant, and handling, one after the other, its numerous cabalistical contrivances, he pondered again, and muttered, Foolish toy! Baby's plaything of haughty admirals and commodores and captains! The world brags of thee! of thy cunning and might. But what, after all, canst thou do but tell the poor, pitiful point where thou thyself happens to be on this wide planet, and the hand that holds thee? No, not one jot more. Thou canst not tell where one drop of water or one grain of sand will be to-morrow noon, and yet with thy impotence thou insultest the sun. Science! Curse thee, thou vain toy, and cursed be all the things that cast man's eyes aloft to that heaven, whose live vividness but scorches him, as these old eyes are even now scorched with thy light, O sun. Level by nature to this earth's horizon are the glances of man's eyes, not shot from the crown of his head, as if God had meant him to gaze on his firmament. Curse thee, thou quadrant! dashing it to the deck. No longer will I guide my earthly way by thee, the level ship's compass, and the level dead reckoning, by log and by line. These shall conduct me, and show me my place on the sea. Aye, lighting from the boat to the deck, thus I trample on thee, thou paltry thing, that feebly pointest on high. Thus I split and destroy thee, as the frantic old man thus spoke, and thus trampled with his live and dead feet, a sneering triumph that seemed meant for Ahab, and a fatalistic despair that seemed meant for himself, these passed over the mute, motionless Parsee's face. Unobserved he rose and glided away, while, awestruck by the aspect of their commander, the seamen clustered together on the forecastle till Ahab, troubledly pacing the deck, shouted out, To the braces! Up helm! Square in! In an instant the yard swung round, and as the ship half wheeled upon her heel, her three firm-seated graceful masts, erectly poised upon her long ribbed hull, seemed as the three horatii, pirouetting on one sufficient steed. Standing between the night-heads, Starbuck watched the Pequod's tumultuous way, and Ahab's also, as he went lurching along the deck. I have sat before dense coal-fire and watched it all aglow, full of its tormented, flaming life, 
and I have seen it wane at last, down, down to dumbest dust. Old man of oceans, of all this fiery life of thine, what will at length remain but one little heap of ashes? I cried Stubb, but sea coal ashes. Mind ye that, Mr. Starbuck, sea coal, not your common charcoal. Well, well, I heard Ahab mutter, here someone thrusts these cards into these old hands of mine, swears I must play them and no others. And damn me, Ahab, but thou actest right. Live in the game, and die in it. End of chapters 114 to 118